Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity again to come together in faith as we approach the Lenten season. Help us to be especially mindful of things we need to chase out of the temple of our hearts uh, in order to sanctify it, in order to make more space for you to dwell. Um, help us to see those little limitations where you pull us along to deeper conversion or uh, a deeper relationship with you and bless our community through this time of capital campaign and building project and all these flourishing ministries and work with our school. Uh, we know it can't bear fruit without your blessing, so we ask you to bless each of us as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. Now and at the hour of our death, amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I'm going to do a faster job of jumping into the text today because 2 Corinthians, uh, uh, I was just talking with Deacon Ron Filardi, um, the bulk of the golden quotes of the Corinthians would be found in 1 Corinthians. If you, you know, people who are familiar with preaching, there's not, a, there's not too many lines or chapters in 2 Corinthians as we uh, come in contact with it that you would normally you're a preach star. There is a wonderful chapter on stewardship. There is a, a passage about carrying the, the good news in earthen vessels, you know, the fragility of uh, those who are asked to preach and cheat and, and, and teach, even though we ourselves are broken and sinners. Um, there's, uh, there is a chapter in which probably the most autobiographical information is given when St. Paul goes into detail about how much he suffered. Um, mostly you hear a, a little bit more of a humble voice even of St. Paul in, in saying that it's when I'm weak that I'm strong. Um, the general context of this letter, I would say, is, is this. That there's still the issue of conflict and it comes in various forms. We heard so many of those in First Corinthians about you know, regarding sexual morality, regarding marriage, regarding things offered to idols, regarding holy order within liturgy, and many other things. Those things are still an issue, but um, Paul chooses not to emphasize them as much for this second letter, mainly because there's an additional challenge now being introduced in the second letter, and that is false teachers are now in the area of Corinth, and they don't think very much of St. Paul, and so he has to kind of go back into the mode of defending his own authority. Um, and so you can see that on display. Uh, you also get a little bit of a sense about how Paul might be different in his letters versus in person. Um, for instance, there's one place in which he says that he's reluctant to go back to court because the last visit didn't go so well. It was a, you know, kind of a harsh and scolding thing. But for the most part, that's not the case. In chapter 10, for instance, um, there's a line that says, For they say his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak, and his speech is of no account. So the critics are saying, Nah, you talk tough in your letters, but then you show up and you're a pussycat. You're not kind of fake, basically. Um, so, I guess you have to factor that in with everything else that you come to believe about St. Paul. Uh, one of the things that becomes apparent, though, is First Corinthians was written from Ephesus. He said he couldn't come. If you recall, he's responding to questions sent to him, and through Timothy also, when he is placed in control there, uh, According to my reading of this second letter, he did go back to Corinth as he promised at the end of the first letter. It sounded like it was not a pleasant encounter, like he was upset at that time, but he's letting them know it, his intent was to come back, I guess, a third time, and he, he's trying to make an excuse in this letter. It seems to be one of the things people are criticizing him about the most. 
because he said he was going to come, but he didn't show up. And he said, it's not because I lack the desire, it's because we're suffering greatly. And where he's suffering, he mentions is Macedonia. Macedonia is meaning that he, he went from Ephesus back to Corinth and back to Philippi. The, Philippi is the area of Macedonia, the country of Alexander the Great. And apparently the suffering there was severe to the point where he said, in part of why he couldn't come is Titus is missing. Um, and my impression is they think Titus might be dead, like maybe he's a martyr. Somebody captured him and killed him. And so he's very anxious of trying to find Titus. And I guess there's a, just a lot of violence and persecution that he's dealing with there. And so he said he couldn't come. But in lieu of that, he writes this letter. Um, and it's, as I say, it's not so quotable. Um, but it has a lot to do with his hurt feelings <laughs> that um, they would think so poorly of him, uh, given the amount of time he's invested there, the friendships he has there, um, and given the amount of suffering he's gone through for the sake of the gospel. So he's just appealing to them to please remember him well and to remember what he taught them. And so you won't see a heavy amount of theological content in here, which hopefully means we we can progress through it at uh, kind of a higher speed. In total, there's 13 chapters in this letter, and so let's just jump in. Um, did, did you all, by the way, get a chance to read 2 Corinthians? Is my description sounding accurate to what you read? A little bit? Okay, for those who read it. All right, so we just pick up right from the beginning of the second letter of Corinthians. Um, his opening statement is as brief as he will ever make it. Um, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints who are in the whole of Achaia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Two simple things. First, he's traveling with Timothy. So he was looking for Titus, but Timothy is his travel companion at this time in Macedonia. And secondly, just notice it's not a huge import, but he's the one guy in the scripture who uses the term saint to apply to living people, um, the faithful, those who become Christians, those who are baptized, they're saints, which is a good thing for us to remember because, as I said last weekend, um, for those who just say, you know what, I'm good enough. Um, if you're not comfortable with the term saint, that's a problem. Because in order to get to heaven, you need to become a saint. <laughs> so we better adjust the bar a little bit. We need to reach for that. So he picks up on the meat of it right from verse 3. Um, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in, in affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. A lot of comfort in there. <laughs> These are moments when as a writing, former writing teacher, I cringe a little bit. But uh, it, there's actually, if I'm going to dig out some theological things, that's actually kind of an important sentence. It says, basically, the reason we're capable of having empathy toward others the reason we're capable of comforting people in suffering is we ourselves first were comforted by God. We get that grace and we're able, you know, we're empowered to pay that forward to other people. Um, for as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we're afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same suffering that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. <laughs> uh, I'll say, this is probably something we were taught in the first year of the seminary, but it's a useful exercise sometimes if you're reading scripture on your own, to do word counts sometimes. You know, if you 
If you read John's Gospel, for instance, you can read a paragraph and the word love might come up 18 times. Um, here, the two words obviously that are most abundant are the word suffering and the word comfort, just over and over again, but obviously just by virtue of how many times he uses those words, um, there's an important connection he's trying to make. Um, and to me, if you read the paragraph through again, the, there's kind of a triangular link between suffering, comfort, and salvation. That salvation is unattainable without suffering. The cross comes along with it, um, but strangely, the mystery of the cross, of St. Egan Stein used to talk about the school of the cross. I cannot understand, honestly, a, a page of her writing. It's so cerebral, except to say a simple concept, which is you cannot learn about the cross except from the cross. You have to enroll in the school of the cross. You can't intellectually read about it. You have to, you have to get cancer and go through cancer treatment to understand, or whatever else whatever form of suffering it takes, uh, it is in the journey of suffering that you learn the mystery of the cross. And through that part of the, the part of the mystery is you gain also comfort in knowing Christ crucified is very close to you in those moments. So there's a strange consolation that comes from that, a feeling of God's closeness. Um, anyway, that's a pretty bizarre paragraph. Um, suffering because it's from him in another letter where he says, I help to complete what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ about the idea of redemptive suffering where we get it. Um, the best modern thing written on suffering to me, which is very consistent through 2,000 years, is, is called The Gospel of Suffering by John Paul II. And he said, when we consider suffering, it's best to think of it like a two-sided coin. On one side, we will see the image of the Good Samaritan that we should strive to alleviate suffering in the world as Christians, as people of faith. When we see people suffering, we, we lift them up, we, we have empathy. Um, and on the other side is redemptive suffering. Because even despite all of our efforts, we won't be able to completely remove suffering. And some people will feel moved by grace to take on voluntary suffering uh, for the sake of souls. So part of what he's saying, by the way, is take comfort in the fact that I'm suffering for you. I'm offering up my, I think the implication is I'm offering up my sufferings for your salvation. So take comfort in that, and you can do that for each other or for me. We're linked in our suffering too. Um, when we think of the church as the body of Christ, it's not our natural instinct. We, you know, if, if the pinky finger is broken, you know, I feel like our modern experience is I'm fed up, not the pinky finger. <laughs> Sorry for your life, but. I'm just fine. No, according to St. Paul, if the pinky finger hurts, the whole body should hurt. We should, we should be supporting the pinky finger and trying to alleviate their suffering. And, and when one part of us has victory, we should all share the victory, that kind of unity. Um, I think that's kind of what he's getting at here anyway, is that you know, we're united in suffering, we're suffering for each other, and there's some mysterious blessing that comes from it. Um, that it's, it's a deep topic. I kind of got the impression from looking at this and looking at it with some other stuff. He's kind of reinforcing to this crowd uh, what he's been teaching them yeah. first and now second. But um, it, it sounds like the community has kind of weakened, fallen apart a little bit. He's kind of yeah. beefing them up, reinforcing, um, trying to I think that's right. I think he is trying to reinforce them. Yeah, you may recall from 1 Corinthians, one of the flaws of this community was kind of a spirit of hedonism. Um, so if you're a hedonist, you're not, you're not in any way embracing suffering. But to me, the most striking thing about that paragraph is 
he's writing from a place of suffering. He's having like a bad half year of his life in Macedonia, kind of fearing for his own life, and yet he's able to make a statement of faith about it. You know? So, I don't know. You could say this could be an intriguing question. Is, is he doing it to bolster their faith or his own? I don't know. Sometimes you need to uh, fake it till you make it. You know what I'm saying? Say what we believe as a reminder to strengthen ourselves when we're going through struggles too. But uh, yeah, I think he's definitely trying to remind them of the important lessons. Then he goes on to say from verse 8, For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. Here he's talking about Macedonia. Um, for we were so utterly, unbearably crushed that we despaired of life itself. I think if you despair of life itself, I think of Elijah, who's being pursued by Jezebel, and he gets to a point where he sits under a broom tree and says, Ah, heck with it. Why don't you just kill me, God? Get it over with. Or, or Moses, you know, there's a time in which he gets so flustered in Meribah and Nassau, he said, A little longer, and this stiff necked people's going to stone you to death. <laughs> so you better act, otherwise, I'm done. That's, that's actually, seems to me, St. Paul describing his own outlook. It's pretty dark um, if you despair of even life itself. Why we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. A super healthy and mature insight to say, I guess God gives us trials so that we are forced to acknowledge, I'm not strong enough to fix this. Only God is strong enough. I got. I have to turn to Him. It's my only answer. That seemed like what they did. Um, he delivered us from so so deadly a peril, and He will deliver us. On Him we have set our hope that He will deliver us again. You also must help us by prayer, so that many will give thanks on behalf for the blessing granted us in answer. To many prayers. So this idea of being linked by prayer also. We pray for missionaries. We pray for people who are you know, in trouble spots on planet earth. For our boast is this. The testimony of our conscience. That we have behaved in the world. And still more toward you with holiness. And godly sincerity. Not by earthly wisdom. But by the grace of God. For we write you nothing but what you can read and understand. I hope you will understand fully as you have understood in part that you can be proud of us as we can be of you on the day of the Lord Jesus. So he's true to his first letter's advice which is if you must boast, boast in the Lord. He's saying you know, that I'm going to boast that God has sustained me through all this difficult time when I see success in your community, I want to boast that God did that for you. Um, and somehow God's grace has sustained us to stay faithful in his mission. Um, that's, I, know, I think testimony like that is more valuable when you hear it from a person who's in a, a dark, suffering place than when everything is golden and wonderful. So um, that takes a lot of strength to, to say something like that. But, um, and, and he gets right into this idea of him being delayed coming to visit them. He, he's aware they're criticizing him as being insincere because, um, you know, he said elsewhere, let your yes mean yes and your no mean no. Don't be a liar. And so you said you were coming and you did come. What's up? Um, he said, be, because I'm sure of this, I wanted to come to you first so that you might have a double pleasure. I wanted to visit you on my way to Macedonia and to come back to you from Macedonia and have you send me on my way to Judea. I was fascinated when I wanted to do this. Do I make my plans like a worldly man ready to say yes and no at once? As surely as God is faithful, our word to you has not been yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, whom we preached among you, Silvanus and Timothy and I, was not yes and no, 
but in him it was always yes. For all the promises of God to find their yes in him. That's why we utter the amen through him, to the glory of God. But it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has commissioned us. He has put his seal upon us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. I have to revise one of my earlier statements. He, he basically saying, my plan was, I need to go to Macedonia because Titus is missing. We know that later, filled in detail. So I thought, since we're on the point A and Macedonia is point B and you are point A, 8.5 or whatever, you're in halfway in the middle, I was going to swing by there on the way up and swing by on the way down and go back to Jerusalem. Um, but his basic point in this paragraph is to say, uh, my heart is willing, but I'm not running the show. <laughs> uh, God blocked that. You know, elsewhere, uh, like in Acts of the Apostles, in the we passages, it talks about St. Paul wanting to go to this or that country, and the Holy Spirit blocked the way. I wanted to go to Asia. I wanted to go to Spain. I wanted to go to this and that place, but it got blocked. And then finally, he had a dream of someone in Macedonia, in Western Europe, saying, come, come, give us the words of salvation. Come, help us. And the way was opened up. So basically saying the problem wasn't on our end, but we're not planning this like a vacation trip. Um, we're being led by the Spirit all the way along, and God had a different idea than we had. So, but I call God to witness against me. Uh, it was to spare you that I refrained from coming to court. Not that we lord it over your faith. We work with you for your joy for you stand firm in your faith. For I made up my mind not to make you another painful visit. So, basically, he, he had one previous pastoral visit that was a little rough, and he, in hindsight, he's grateful that if I had come, I probably would have had a lot of nice to say to you. So, probably better if I got blocked. Um, for if I cause you pain, who is there to make me glad but the one whom I have pained? I wrote as I did, so that when I came, I might not suffer pain from those who should have made me rejoice. For I felt sure of all of you that my joy would be the joy of you all. He's saying here, he's actually giving an answer to the chapter 10 passage, I, uh, the criticism I read before, that your, your writing style is tough, but in person you're kind of a pussy caddy. He's saying, I write tough so that when I come, we can have a fun visit. And I don't have to scold people. I'm hoping that you'll hear my words in a letter and um, take note and make some changes. Um, for I wrote you out of much affliction and anguish of heart and with many tears, not to cause you pain, but to let you know the abundant love that I have for you. So, you know, uh, tough love, kind of a letter, I guess you could say. Um, you may recall in uh, going back, exact chapter I'd have to look up again, but in 1 Corinthians we talked about uh, early example of excommunication. Do you recall that? There was a, a young man married to, well, I'm not married. He was having sexual relations with his father's wife. It's not clear from that description if we're talking about his mother, like his biological mother, or if his father had multiple wives, or if his second wife, or whatever. But anyway, they're having a uh, uh, a love triangle between father and son and this woman, and it was a scandal, and everybody was talking about it in a kind of tee hee hee, that's <laughs> taken away. Instead of, instead of confronting it and saying, This is ungodly, this should not be happening. And so he ordered everyone to have nothing to do with this guy. And we, we talked at the time, if you recall, that seems like it went from zero to 60 rather quickly, like he went to DEFCON 5 and dropped a nuclear bomb on the guy, but. Uh, I, I mentioned my presumption is that he, he would have followed the guidance of Scripture in, in this case and first approach a person one on one and if they don't listen bring a friend and if they don't listen bring the weight of the church and only after all these things have been tried excommunication but this next passage is actually addressing that person again Scripture scholars think and he's telling them um, I want to end this, this period of excommunication I think they've learned their lesson, they've suffered enough, uh, it's time to welcome them back into the community. 
So if it's a reminder, excommunication doesn't need to be a permanent thing. Um, so that's what this passage from chapter 2, verse 5 is about. Um, but if anyone has caused pain, he has caused it not to me, but in some measure, not to put it too severely to you all. For such a one, this punishment by the majority is enough, so you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him, or you may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So I beg you to reaffirm your love for him, for this is why I wrote, that I might test you and know whether you are obedient in everything. Anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. What I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ, to keep Satan from gaining an advantage over us, for we are not ignorant of his designs. So, uh, an excommunication, a formal uh, writ of excommunication can be rescinded by the same bishop that issues it. Uh, and it shows his, shows St. Paul's mercy. Well, even though he has a tough side, he also has a empathetic heart. And then he goes back to Troas. This is the area of Macedonia again. Once again, describing a little bit of his sufferings. Um, when I came to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ, the door was open to me in the Lord, but my mind could not rest because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I took leave of them and went on to Macedonia. But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumph, and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of Him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one a fragrance from death to death, to the other a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? For we are not like so many peddlers of God's word, but as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God on the sight of God, we speak in Christ. I feel like Paul being an editor in that section. He just keeps going back in a very non-linear way. My brain wants to be linear, but he he hops around. But at the end of this letter, you'll get the full conclusion. It was a pretty rough ride in Macedonia. Every time he flashes back to that. Any comments or questions about the first two chapters? Okay. So, chapter three, Lord of chapter three. Um, chapter three, so again, he's addressing people attacking his character. And there's a sarcastic, snarky comment in the beginning, like, uh, where he said, do I have to provide a letter of recommendation to y'all? Like, you don't even know me? Um, and his point will be, you're my letter of recommendation. You're the fruit of my work. If people want to know what kind of minister I am, I would say, look at the community I founded. That's me. Um, so he kind of thumps it back to whoever's being critical. I think it's particular of these false teachers that he says that he says are now in his wake causing some problems in Corinth. So are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, as some do, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter of recommendation written on your hearts to be known and read by all men. And you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God. Not that we are sufficient ourselves to claim anything as coming from us. Our sufficiency is from God, who has qualified us to be ministers of a new covenant, not in a written code, but in the spirit. For the written code kills, but the spirit gives life. Uh, this is a, a little bit of a hint toward Galatians, that kind of thing, that this new covenant is not a legalistic thing. God's law written on our heart and the grace given to us through the Holy Spirit that allows us to live this covenant. Um, this, is, this is the one we're about. Now if the dispensation of death carved in the letters on stone came with such splendor that the Israelites could not look at Moses' face because of its brightness, fading as this was, 
Will not the dispensation of the Spirit be attended with greater splendor? For if there was splendor in the dispensation of condemnation, the dispensation of righteousness must far exceed it in splendor. Indeed, in this case, what once had splendor has come to have no splendor at all because of the splendor that surpasses it. A lot of splendor in this one. For if what faded away came with splendor, what is permanent must have much more splendor. Let me just capture the chase here. He's trying to make, he's trying to use the typology here. It's a little sloppy at the start, honestly, but it's kind of nifty in the end if you know the story of Moses. Um, the people with Moses, at, at one point, God spoke to all the people. They heard all the clamor, they heard the trumpet blast, but they kind of freak out about it. And they actually come to Moses and say, we don't want God to speak to us like that anymore, it's too scary. Could you just arrange it that God speaks to you alone? Which is sad, that's like, that's bad fruit of sin. Somebody say, I don't want to be so close to God, please let me be a little further away. I don't want that intimate relationship. So Moses is nominated, and eventually they set up a meeting tent, a tabernacle, amongst the people. And whenever Moses feels it's time to speak to God face to face, his little friend, like Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, uh, he, he trumps out and goes down this middle lane, and everyone watches from their tent, kind of hiding in their tent in a chicken-like fashion. He goes into the tent, and he's accompanied by the cloud, the Shekinah cloud. It's a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day. So people can see visually, God is walking with him. Um, they go in the tent for a while. When he comes out, um, Scripture says his hair turned white initially from these encounters. So splendidly white hair, hair club for men, you know, Santa Claus look. But his face is literally glowing so that no one can look at him without freaking out. He's almost too godlike. So they're already afraid of God, but they're afraid of Moses now too. So it says he had to resort to wearing a veil over his face. That it wasn't a permanent condition over time. This, this brightness would fade and then he could interact with people. But initially when he'd come out of his tent, because of his appearance, people couldn't handle even looking at him. So Paul essentially says this veil, um, it's like the Old Testament. The Old Testament's a veil. Uh, it's half hidden. The truth is contained in it or hidden in such a way that it's easier to approach. But the New Testament is full of bright light and splendor, um, more spectacular. So that's the typology he's talking about. So I'll just pick up from verse 12, if that makes sense to people. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold. Not like Moses who put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not see the end of the fading splendor. But their minds were hardened, for to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ is it taken away. Christ is the one who reveals the splendor of God, the fullness of the truth. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their minds. But when a man turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being changed into His likeness from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Uh, I don't know if I've ever seen a painting of Moses with a glowing face before. Has any of you? There is a, uh, I think it's in the, the Basilica of Peter and Chains in Rome, though. There, there is a piece of art. I think it's Michelangelo who did this statue of Moses. Um, but it's based on a, an incorrect translation. So, um, he is reading about these rays of light coming off of Moses' face, but apparently the word is very close to the word for horns. So you might look at the statue and think this is a 
This is like a centaur or a satyr or some, some kind of thing from Greek mythology. It's actually meant to be Moses, but Moses has horns in this because of a misunderstanding of the translation. It's supposed to try to capture Moses in his glory. Have you seen this before? Yeah, it's yeah. actually it's right on the screen. What is it? It's on the screen. Okay. Yeah, it's I've seen it before, but I think when I saw it, it was in display in the church where Peter's chains are kept, where the chains came off him from prison. Anyway, if you Google it, you'll find it. Moses was horns on his head or something. Those crazy Catholics, man. So I'm not going to it. It's a little wild. <laughs> yes. Instead of like the Jewish people at the time hiding in their tent watching Moses go to the meeting tent, he's saying, those of you who are Christian, it says though you're walking with Moses, you're going into the meeting tent. You're you're being able to see the splendor of God, his, his full truth. So that's the main point he's trying to strive to make. Any other thoughts about that? You're right. <laughs> Is it Peter and James? Well, no, it's me. There's probably copies of it too, though, in the museum or something. But yeah, it's a good a good Google homework assignment. Look uh, up Moses for horns. Just know it was a uh, mistranslation. That's probably the most famous artistic screw up in human history. Now that I think about it, that's a pretty bad one. <laughs> okay, from chapter four, then that's where we pick up here. By the way, these, these chapters, more than other letters we've read so far, they're pretty arbitrary. They're interrupting thoughts where the chapter headings are, so it's not that helpful, I find. There's no there's no subtitles in the middle because it's just a continued thought, but arbitrarily chapter four appears here. So therefore having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. We have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled only to those who are perishing. In, the, in their case, the God of their world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the likeness of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants, for, for Jesus' sake. For it is the God, for it is, and it's weird, it's the God. For it is the God who said, let light shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. And here comes one of the few famous lines of Second Corinthians, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels to show that the transcendent power belongs to God and not to us. What you need to hear in this is First Corinthians, God chooses the weak to shame the strong, God chooses the fool to shame the wise, um, so that you know no one would believe this lonely person is doing this thing on their own. It's it's actually a very convincing argument to say the only explanation is supernatural because this person has no abilities. Um, so when he says we are earthen vessels, he's saying obviously the splendor of the truth of the good news not coming from our little brains. It's too amazing for that. It's It has a supernatural source. So we are earthen vessels. That is a statement we can apply to all of us because we all have a fallen nature. We all sin. We're all, we all have wounds. But we can also be wounded healers. We can also, with God's grace, convey the, the message despite our shortcomings. You know? We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. 
always carrying the body, the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. That's a beautiful line. It's, it's another line where he's touching on the, this idea of the value of suffering. You know, uh, to the extent that we're persecuted, we suffer, we carry our cross, um, we are displaying the woundedness of Christ so that the resurrection of Christ can also shine through for people to see. Uh, for while we live, we are always being given up to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Um, that, that paragraph's a little ma mini masterpiece, I would say, of that passage. Um, since we have the same spirit of faith as he had, who wrote, I believed, and so I spoke, we do believe, and so we speak knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. Um, so he's saying, you know, in our woundedness, in our weakness, the life of Christ shines forth, but even to the extent that our life should be taken from us, we trust in God, we know He'll raise us from the dead, and we believe in the resurrection at the end of time. And eventually, in a couple sentences, this will lead into the, one of the most famous chapters of Second Corinthians, which is read very often at funerals. Um, but I'll finish verse 16 through 18 here. So, we do not lose heart. Though our outer man is wasting away, our inner man is being renewed every day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Because we look for, we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. A couple things there. Basically, that's the fancier way of saying store your treasure in heaven, that everything you can see in this life is passing away. Um, but it also, there's a little tie into our idea of glory, individual glory and merit. We believe that to the extent that people carry out courageous, virtuous acts in this life, this adds to your own individual glory in heaven. So when, it's, when he says uh, um For this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. The idea that uh, no good goes unrewarded by God who is just. We have to answer for every sin, but also for, for virtuous holy acts. Um, God recognizes those also. And so here's the famous passage from, from funerals. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God. A house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Here indeed we groan and long to put on our heavenly dwelling so that by putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we sigh with anxiety, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we're always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith and not by sight. That's a very famous line. We walk by faith and not by sight. We are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home from the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive good or evil according to what He has done in the body. Um, there's a passage later in his letters where, where Paul gets to such the point of surrender where he says, I don't know whether it's better to live or to die. Because if I live, I can serve the Lord. But if I die, I can be with the Lord. So I leave that decision up to God. If I use whatever outcome, it could be a blessing for me. I can either be of more service to other people and save souls, or I can say my fight is over and I, I can be with the Lord now and no more.
we're suffering. Um, he's kind of just beginning to touch on that idea here to say um, we each have to we each have to go through that. It's part of our leading this world. Okay, well, from verse 11. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. The fear of the Lord, I guess I'll just say it quickly, it appears all over the Bible. Um, I think you all know this, but it's not, the Greek word is not the word to be terrified. It's not that kind of fear like going to a horror movie. It's, um, it's more like the feeling of, I, I don't want to disappoint God. Um, he's been so good to me, I want to give my best to Him. I don't want to fall short. I just want to show my appreciation. I want to show my best self. And it also speaks of a kind of a really strong desire for reverence in the presence of God. To be like Moses and take your shoes off, you're standing on holy ground, that kind of idea, so as not to offend God. Um, Knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. But what we are known, but what we are known to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. Okay, I'm going to read that sentence. Okay. <laughs> but what we are is known to God, and I hope it's known also to your conscience. So, God is the only one qualified to judge your heart. We're not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to be proud of us so that you may be able to answer those who pride themselves on a man's position and not on his heart. So again, it goes back to 1 Corinthians, this battle for esteem and prestige and social standing. He is basically saying this, like, I'm done with all that. If you can, I hope you can feel proud in seeing how much we suffered for you and for the gospel. That's all you need to know about us. Um, for if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it's for you. For the love of Christ urges us on because we're convinced that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might live no longer for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. This line right there is uh, one of the lines the Catholic Church uses to apply to the sacrament of confession. Uh, to say that uh, we've been reconciled through Christ and through him uh, he gave us the ministry of reconciliation that is in Christ God was reconciled in the world to himself not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation so we're ambassadors for Christ God making his appeal through us we beg you on behalf of Christ be reconciled to God for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is a really common theme in theology. He became like us so we could become more like him. He took on our humanity so we could take on his divinity. Uh, the one who was like us in all we but sin took on our sin so that we could become sinless. That whole kind of reversing of positions. Um, I think you can see though, there's not, there aren't really strong themes of theology here. It's really a sentimental sort of writing about being in a room, having a really tough time in Macedonia. Okay, I guess I'm a little confused about this um, hierarchy with the church that is being born. That is, Paul is part of the, um, the bishop, say, and then there are these other. That's Paul's question, too. 
You say, why are you, why are you listening to these guys? I'm the one who started this community. I, I'm the one who loves you. I'm the one who's concerned about you. So you're being led astray by people. I don't know if that's his frustration with false teachers all through his letters. Well, that's in part why these writings are timeless, and there are certain things that you can apply to every generation. Um, but if you think, I mean, in some ways I would argue he's trying to keep it more simple. He's saying, love is the greatest gift among all the gifts. Get that one right. Uh, anything you've been given is given to share, to build up the body of Christ, that you have to work in unity. Um, in this case, a strong theme of reconciliation, even with the guy who was excommunicated. I say, if you can forgive him, I forgive him. That's a welcome back. Um, be reconciled to each other. That little bit speaks to the division and conflict that's still going on in Corinth, I think. Just, we need a big, we need a big reconciliation service for this whole community, for everyone to come together. That is one, uh, for those who've seen The Chosen Season 3, I love the opening. It's great. Uh, they do a really good job of kind of convicting the apostles as like my family vacation. You know, <laughs> we would get in the station wagon, 10 of us, I don't know, we'd all fit in there like a clown car. And you're like five, minutes, five miles down the road, already someone saying, are we there yet? <laughs> and pretty soon you're punching your brother and pulling your sister's hair. And, you know, by lunchtime, you're ready to murder a few people. <laughs> well, the apostles are kind of depicted a little bit like that they're getting on each other's nerves. And at the Sermon on the Mount, uh, it focuses on one passage where it says, if, you, if you're about to offer your offering to, the, to God at the altar and you recognize you have a division with the brother, leave your offering and go first and make peace. And it shows a number of these people in um, Jesus' entourage who take that to heart and go, you know, Matthew goes and apologizes to his parents for bringing scandal on the family and causing his father to go bankrupt. And uh, other people who apologize, you know, I think uh, one of the apostles has to apologize to Mary Magdalene and back and forth. And, um, anyway, and they all say at the same, isn't it, doesn't it feel better? I think it's better. <laughs> we like, let go of a lot of garbage. Uh, easier to love each other so, anyway, it's kind of, he's advocating that, I think, also for the Corinthians. Um, I think we have time for one more chapter here. I think these are short. Um, chapter 6. I just put a big frowning face on chapter 6. I don't know what that means. <laughs> Sometimes my notes are late in the day. It's like, I think I'll just draw a picture of this one. <laughs> <laughs> Working together with him, then, we entreat you not to accept the grace of God in vain. For he says, at the acceptable time, I have listened to you and helped you on the day of salvation. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. I love this line. If you're a procrastinator by nature, you need to highlight this line. It's really powerful. Ah, next, next January 1st. That seems like a good time to start it. Or, ah, uh, shoot, February's already part over. March 1st, that's a good number. Or next Monday, I like to start things on the first day of the week. You know, we always have this little game we play. This past, yeah, Ash Wednesday, just a couple weeks away, I will make it a Lenten thing. Why not? Don't want to peak too soon, you know? <laughs> Behold, now. Is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. That's beautiful. Now. Our God is the God of now. Every day is the right day to start something new. Um, so, anyway, that's a little power quote if, for procrastinators. <laughs> we put no obstacle in anyone's way, so that no fault may be found with our ministry. 
But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way through great endurance and afflictions, hardships, calamities, 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 calamities. I'm of the age now where I have glasses that don't help me see, and I don't wear glasses I can't see. So sometimes the letters move around on me. The calamities, beatings, imprisonments, tumults, labors, watching, hunger, by purity, knowledge, forbearance, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left in, in honor and dishonor, in ill repute and good repute. I'll be honest, that's probably why I put the frowny face. That sentence right there. I need to diagram that whole thing, all these mishmash of words. <laughs> We're treated as imposters and yet are true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying, and behold we live, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, and making many rich is having nothing and yet possessing everything. They are they are like a living riddle. <laughs> these missionaries shows us the paradox of when you follow God. All these kind of paradoxes. Our mouth is open to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted in your own aff affections. In return, I speak as to children, widening your hearts. So. I'm not holding you back. Your own hearts are holding you back. If you're being held back, it's by your own sinfulness. So, go big. Do not be mismatched with unbelievers. Now, this is weird, because in 1 Corinthians, he said, if you're mismatched and your, your partner is a non-believer, uh, for the sake of the salvation of that person, if they can stand you, you should stay together, and maybe you can help them get to heaven. Now he's saying, don't be mismatched. So anyway, it comes from the phrase of being equally yoked. It works best. It's more ideal if you find someone who shares your faith, who, who shares your central priority. Um, for what partnerships have righteousness and iniquity? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, as God said, I will live in them and move among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore come out from them and be separated from them, says the Lord, and touch nothing unclean, and I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters, says the, the Lord Almighty. This is a, that's a very Jewish passage right there, but kind of from the idea the Jewish vocation is to be a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people set apart to say, be, live among the Canaanites, but don't mingle with the Canaanites, don't pick up their bad habits. Um, you're supposed to be a light, a beacon shining on a hill for them by the way you live. Um, and I'll just go this extra last night. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit and make holiness perfect in the fear of God. Um, that's probably a place to stop. We got through six chapters. What I'm going to do is, I think we're finishing it next time. It's 13 chapters. The, there's a few good, rich chapters in the second half here, but um, I think the best part is when he, he starts giving inventory of how many shipwrecks and how many times it was tortured and everything, and you just say, oh my goodness. If you're like me at all, that, that's a conviction. Uh, sometimes, you know, I share my faith, someone calls me a bad name. And I'm like, where, where, call me a bad name? <laughs> that's when you need to turn to that chapter, St. Paul, and hear what he went. My skin is thicker than that. I can, I can take a sliver of the cross, you know? <laughs> so, you know, there is, I would say there are some good passages in here for, for self-strengthening. Uh, the winner, the two winners for today is that we are earthen vessels, you know? And I love this one about now is the acceptable time today. 
This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So, um, we just end there. I'll stick around for questions if you have any. Um, but I'll try to read through the rest of 2 Corinthians before next time. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be. The world without an end. Amen. May Almighty God bless you this week. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Have a wonderful week.